Hello, my name is Dick Insminger, Emergency Trained Physician Assistant, lecturing today for APP to APP virtual lectures on cardiac evaluation, primarily red flags uh, in rural primary care. Uh, my experience and background is in paramedicine, EMS. Um, I worked for a while as a PA within a FQHC 52 miles from the nearest hospital. Um, which required um, cardiac evaluations to determine uh, need for ED evaluation. My current role is within the correctional department. Um, so I do evaluate quite a bit of um, cardiac patients uh, to determine whether or not they need to be evaluated at the hospital, uh, which requires a significant amount of logistics to get a incarcerated patient to the hospital. Uh, these patients, however, do have significant chronic care issues which could be a higher risk for cardiac issues. I have no disclosures to uh, present. I would like to start with a close disclaimer. Uh, this lecture is intended for informational purposes. You should always use your sound clinical judgment when evaluating cardiac patients. And I would say you should always err on the side of caution. So if your gut instinct says there might be something going on with the patient, you should definitely have them evaluated at the emergency department just to ensure that there's not any detriment to your patient uh, or deterioration upon their release. And like I said, um, when in doubt, send them out. So if you just have something gnawing in your stomach that says there's something going on with this person, go with your gut instinct and definitely have them evaluated. The objectives for this lecture are as a quick review and approach of the cardiac complaints using the red flag approach. A lot of people and a lot of you have a significant amount of experience, and I do understand uh, that this may seem, you know, somewhat um, benign or um, someone you already know quite a bit. Um, but it is important to review these um, uh, skills on a regular basis, especially if you do work in a primary care setting to ensure that you're not missing anything. Uh, and or not over sending patients to the emergency department, increasing the burdens along with the healthcare system. Second is to understand the importance of history taking and risk factors. Um, typically with a red flag approach, one, you look for specific things that say this person does need further evaluation. But if you're not quite clear, a lot of times it's the history and the risk factors of the patient that will help determine whether or not the patient needs to be evaluated. Third, understanding the significance of vitals. This is often overlooked. A lot of times patients um, are seen with uh, hypertension or other vitals, but it's very close significance that needs to be uh, taken into account as your initial presentation and the vital sign review can oftentimes tell you right off the bat whether a patient needs to be sent or not. Uh, review obvious and subtle EKG findings. We also we all know the EKG, ST elevation, ST depressions, all those kind of things. I just want to review some less common um, and maybe le less known uh, EKG findings you should be watching out for. Uh, I would like to review important differentials not to miss, and then also considering uh, when to determine ED evaluation is appropriate, especially in a rural setting. Always erring on the side of caution, as I said earlier. Chest pain is the second most common complaint and often seen in the emergency department. And of those complaints, uh, you can further break it down. So it's usually 5% of all the department visits, like I said earlier. 31% uh, of these turn out to be an ACS syndrome. Uh, as you go down, pulmonary embolism, pneumothorax, uh, tamponades, such, all of these are important differentials not to miss. Uh, there's also other common complaints that are a little bit less um, obviously life-threatening, such as bird, gastritis, musculoskeletal issues. And all of these things can be broken down, especially based off your evaluation. And a lot of these uh, more higher intensity, uh, more worrisome complaints, such as C ACS and pulmonary embolism, all those kind of things can oftentimes be sorted out through a red flag approach uh, in looking at the patient's uh, history and examination, looking for those specific findings when you target your exam. Chest pain evaluations is a law of probability. So chest pain uh, includes like a focus assessment subjected to an objective. And what you're looking for is you're looking for underlying risk factors and or underlying um, symptoms or findings on your exam that increase the probability that the patient does have some significant problem going on that needs evaluation. Uh, 
Now, if these things can be systematically kind of ruled out, uh, your probability decreases, especially through your exam and non finding these um, red flag symptoms. This is a great flying I found on up to date. Um, it shows the likelihood ratios of MI associated with chest pain when you're doing your complaint history or uh, the patient presents with a chest pain history. Uh, things that do increase the probability are radiation to the right arms or shoulders, as we all know, bilateral arms, exertional chest pain, all the things we're kind of taught in school. One of the things that might be overlooked sometimes is nausea and vomiting. That's a very uh, important one to look out for and increases the probability of having an underlying ACS issue. Not that we're only going to talk about ACS in this lecture, but um, it is important. Some, some uh, complaints are things you might find that decrease the likelihood of uh, of underlying ACS are pleuritic pain, so it, taking a deep breath and it hurts. Now, that may decrease ACS. However, you do have to consider things like pulmonary embolism, um, pneumothorax, and other things. Uh, positional, sometimes, you know, person lays back, it gets worse. A lot of times you might think of pancreatitis, less like the ACS. Sharp pain may be associated with musculoskeletal, may be associated with PE. Uh, you know, uh, inframammaries around the mammary glands, you might have some, you know, um, changes as far as um, hormonal changes, and then obviously non-exertional pain. Um, all of these things can kind of decrease your likelihood of, of potential underlying MI syn uh, syndromes. Now, again, these may decrease it. However, when you put in your risk factors and you put in your vital signs, that may up the probability and maybe, you know, a little bit might be a little bit more suspicious that this might be going on. Obviously, you know, EKGs will help you, but they're not always the ultimate uh, diagnostic tool as well. So we'll talk about that too. Differentials, we kind of just talked about those big important ones. Obviously, somebody shows up with a chest pain or cardiovascular complaint, you're going to be worried about ACS, right? Especially that, you know, say older gentleman, He's got crushing chest pain. It's non, you know, it radiates to his both of his arms. You know, it started gradually or even suddenly some point, sometimes. Um, not alleviated by anything. Um, that's a very important one. Obviously, it's going to be pretty straightforward. Now, aortic dissection or aortic aneurysm is a very commonly missed uh, differential or diagnosis within the emergency department. It's not always thought of, you know. In the emergency department, you get a person that has, you know, chest pain, it may be radiating to their back or maybe, you know, to their arm. You get serial troponins. You don't find anything. Um, and then suddenly you're like, oh, maybe I should check for that. You know, you're not seeing anything on chest X-ray. Um, unfortunately, you know, some of these patients are discharged home. So it's something definitely to keep on your differential because it, it can have serious detrimental effects if it's not found. Uh, embolism, we talked about earlier. You know, specific patients are at higher risk for this arrhythmias, infectious diseases. I see this quite a bit within uh, the correctional setting. There's a lot of IV drug users. So endocarditis, which may not be seen in some areas based on their population base. However, it is something to always be on your mind, especially those patients that may have a mild fever, may present with a little bit of URI symptoms. Uh, and you also notice a new onset murmur. These patients should be very highly suspicious for potential underlying endocarditis. Myocarditis, pancreas, or pericarditis, obviously pericarditis is a little bit less uh, a life-threatening issue. Some lower stuff, you know, gastrointestinal reflux, musculoskeletal pain. Um, big one is esophageal rupture. It's not something we often think about, especially those people that are post-scope. Um, a lot of times it's associated with nausea, vomiting. They can't eat. They'll throw it up. Um, those kind of things are also, also, uh, also something we should always think about, you know, coughing up some blood, uh, blood in their vomit, things like that. Uh, we just talk about pericarditis. Shingles is a important one, especially to do a full exam. So you actually want to look at the skin. So I'm having chest pain and you'll pull up the skin. You see that vesicular rash that's running along the side of their chest, higher probability for underlying, you know, zoster infection. Uh, we talked about embolism already, Surg cervical radiculopathy. A lot of times pain can be radiating from the neck down to the arms. We all know that. Uh, esophageal spasm. So all these things, it's important with your history and your exam to try to determine what, what is going on here. 
Um, and it also takes a thorough focused assessment of these patients to try to really figure it out, especially in the rural areas. So I'd like to go over a quick rapid assessment for cardiac review. Now, some of this stuff is also, you know, it comes from my time working within, you know, pre-hospital medicine, so an EMS. So, you know, a lot of times our scene times were between six to eight minutes. We do a very focused exam. A lot of times, you know, we know exactly what's going on. When you first walk in the room, you can see the patient and you kind of go through a, a you know, a, a process in your head of evaluating the patient. Now, I think this applies all the way down the road. So, you know, I teach at a university sometimes. Also kind of, this has helped me along. I still teach that now. And I also still use that in my current position within the correctional setting to determine whether or not a person needs to go or not uh, based on, you know, how sick they look and then based on their history and their risk factors that kind of tell me exactly where to go. And then their physical exam looking for any red flag symptoms or signs, I'm sorry. So rapid chest assessment, you know, it's it's very just pain or cardiovascular assessment. It's pretty straightforward. So one thing a lot of people don't do is, you know, they hear somebody comes in, you know, they're dizzy or there's something going on. You didn't expect them to come and you kind of get worked up. So you get a little bit kind of, oh, you know, this patient may have something, you know, going on. I need to get them out of here as fast as you can. But really, you need to start with the basics when you walk in the room. So the first one is always start with your initial impression. So how does the patient look? Are they pink, warm, and dry? Are they smiling? Do they look like this guy? You walk in, he's pink, he's warm, he's dry, he's smiling at you. Um, a little, not really a ton of distress. So, you know, maybe I have a little bit more time to assess this patient. Now, had he looked pale, had he sweat, um, had he been cringed forward, something like that, then obviously you would say, oh, okay, I don't have very much time. Um, this patient needs to be moving along or I need to focus my assessment much, much quicker. Second is, is quickly delegating tasks. A lot of times people go straight for the patient. Um, they have a lot of people watching around them. They might have an MA, they may have a nurse, they may have somebody else, but those people can be put to work. A lot of times they want to be put to work. So, you know, getting yourself vital signs, maybe they just came in the door, maybe that's already done. Uh, maybe having somebody fetch the 12 lead EKG if they find it. These kind of things are important, but those vital signs are the second thing. So your initial impression and then your vital signs. So looking at your vital signs, you know, is their pulse fast? Is it too slow? Is their blood pressure good? Um, are they satting well? Those kind of things. And a lot of times, one thing I always do is when you walk up to the patient and you're evaluating their initial impression, so you're looking at their face to see if they're pale or sweaty or diaphoretic, is you put your fingers on their pulse and check their radius. Is it regular? Is it way too fast? Is it over 150? Is it irregular and over, you know, 120, 130? Are you worried about you know, RVR? Those kind of things, because just finding those simple things tells you right off the bat that the person is stable or unstable. So my patient is, you know, looks pink, but they look in distress. They're complaining of dizziness. I walk in, I put my fingers on their radius, and I can't even count the regular pulse. They're probably in supraventricular tachycardia. That person needs to be moved along and converted. Uh, EMS can do that or whatever your facility is able to do. Now, if those two things are fine, then you focus on the symptom and description. So what's going on? Oh, ask open-ended questions. What's going on? You know, my chest hurts or I'm dizzy or those kind of things. And then you lead based off of that, uh, building on, you know, their complaints. And what you're looking for is you're looking for things that the patient tells you that increase the probability of potential underlying cardiovascular disease or something going on in those specific red flags, right? So my chest is, it's this worst boring pain I've ever felt in my chest. Does it move anywhere? It goes to my back and it radiates down my arms and I'm feeling tinglingness in my hands. Right off the bat, especially if that's somebody who is say in their seventies and you find out they're a chronic smoker and they have uncontrolled blood pressure issues and they look pale and they're in significant distress, high probability of underlying aortic aneurysm. So that person or dis early dissection, they need to go right off the bat. Now, if those things don't 100%, you know, leading you to, then you move on to their past medical history. Now, you're just looking for pertinent things. So hypertension, 
um, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, all those kind of things. Uh, their medication, if they can't tell you, just looking straight at their med list, a lot of times you guys will be familiar with these patients because they are your patients. Um, but sometimes, like with me, with the FQHC, sometimes now I just fill in. So sometimes we get patients that drive from the rural areas all around, and they just show up at the clinic, and I have to look at their meds because sometimes they don't even know what they're taking them for. So that's going to give me an idea of what problems are underlying. So more cardiac meds I see, the more risk that, that there's a potential underlying cardiovascular disease. Again, this may seem extremely simple and obvious, but sometimes this stuff is overlooked. Then after that, you ascertain risk factors. Like I said, IV drug abuse, um, smoking history, you know, all, uh, family history, even that kind of stuff. Obviously, if you're doing that, these patients are more stable. So they're not the ones that look pale. They're not the ones that are sweating. They're not the ones that have a heart rate of 30 those kind of things, those people just need to go. So these are the patients that are a little bit kind of right in that area. They look okay for the moment. Maybe I can dig a little bit deeper. Um, and then always consider and focus your exam to include these red flags. So when you're doing your exam and you're looking at this patient that's got heart, obviously you're gonna listen to their heart. You're gonna listen for murmurs. You're gonna listen to their lungs, see if there's any rowels, see if you're hearing loud sounds on both sides. Do they have a pneumo, especially if they're a younger person? any palpable masses in their belly, right? Radiation up into their neck, any edema in their legs that's new. Now, some of these patients obviously might have chronic edema, but you know, one, is that new or is that not new? So those kind of things are very important as well. Those could kind of show you the body's ability to compensate, especially in some ways, um, that might be kind of overtaken after a certain amount of time. Those are the things you really should do some things you don't, you should not do is some people do these things is that, you know, assume that a younger patient is non-cardiac. So a patient that comes in, it's 28 years old, complaining of chest pain, oh, it's probably anxiety. Um, you know, you're probably just fine. You know, uh, you know, you're too young for this, but those kind of things are not 100% true. So we're seeing more hyperlipidemia. We're seeing more patients with um you know, uh, smoking history, seeing more patients with drug abuse, all those kind of patients, but also just looking at the patient in general, like, are they tall and lanky? Um, do they look like they have a connective tissue disease? Do they look like they might have a Marfan's going on that may be undiagnosed? That may be concerning for an underlying rupture or aneurysm. Um, those kind of things are very important. Never assume that it's just not, um, especially if you look into their histories, uh, of, of, you know, um, later teens girl that or, or woman that's you know on birth control that smokes might have a you know a deep pain within their chest um you're not 100 percent sure but you think maybe they have a pe so you feel their pulse they're tachycardic and they feel like they can't catch their breath then you feel down on their calves and they oh it doesn't hurt now but it did hurt before i had some swelling in my legs i wasn't sure about it it might be you know red flag for underlying you know pulmonary embolism um, those kind of things. Uh, don't also assume that atypical complaints are benign. So, you know, something like sharp pain can't be ACS or, you know, it just radiate, you know, I'm just feeling it in my right arm. That, those kind of things always, it takes more evaluation. Sometimes some people can get a bit, little bit, um, you know, uh, comfortable when they don't hear those exact things we hear in the textbook sometimes. And, you know, don't, if you have the ability and you have the chart and you do have an EKG, never forget to look at it and compare it to another one that you're getting. So these patients are obviously, like we said earlier, they're on the stable side. But if I see changes in this EKG compared to this EKG, those patients should probably be sent out. You, you, know, you definitely should send those patients out for evaluation. And then don't limit your exam to heart and lungs. Um, the belly is very important. The calves are very important. The carotids are very important. Um, even uh, radial pulses, pedal pulses, and looking for edema. Those things are really important uh, when evaluating the patient. Don't, don't forget about those things. Also, just a general skin exam. Am I seeing a rash? Um, you all heard about the splinter hemorrhages that people can get, especially when they're you know, IV drug abuse, or they might have lesions along their leg 
with that murmur and that maybe you or I are fever. Those are kind of things are endocarditis based that you should worry about those kind of things. And again, this is one approach that I've always found is concentrate and listen for red flags. Okay, so front to back pain. Okay, it, I, there's nothing I can do to make it better. Um, it's radiating down both my arms. Um, I was mowing the lawn when it happened. Um, I felt like I was going to pass out. I was laying down. It woke me up from sleep. All those kind of things. Those increase the probability that there's probably some cardiac vascular event going on. And these patients do require further examination uh, with testing that's not available typically within the primary care clinic. So the focus cardiac examination, like we said earlier, when you first, when you start, keep calm and start with the basics. What do they look like, right? When you walk in the door and you introduce yourself, what do they look like? Are they pale? Are they talking to you? Do they seem like they're in distress, okay? <clears throat> when you see that, obviously, if they're distressed, they're pale, and they don't look good, they can't sit up. You know, those are kind of things, you know, you're going to move the patient along, but, you know, you're, that's what you're focused in on. You're focused in on what the patient looks like. And at doing that, make sure you delegate. So you're delegating things around you. Did you get the vitals? Can you get the vitals? Can someone go get the EKG machine? Um, can somebody go get something else? Those kind of things. If there's patients in the room, you know, or the patients in the room, you have staff in the room, use them. Um, if there's too many people in the room, move them out. So somebody, you know, multiple family members sometimes can be in there. Those kind of things just increase <clears throat> anxiety, especially among staff, especially among the patient, even you. Uh, it happens to me. I mean, you know, you're, you have all these people watching you. They want you to help them. They want you to determine what's going on. So removing those anxious anxiety type situations really can help significantly. And like, this is just what we went over before. So in the initial impression, how do they look? This is one great thing a, a professor told me one point, if they sweat, you sweat. So if you see sweat beating off their brow, um, that can be a sign of uh, uh, impending instability. So, you know, that's a comp compensatory mechanism sometimes. So be very aware of that. So if you see a beads of sweat, there's something going on with the patient. Check their pulse when you're delegating tasks. So. Hello, Mr. So-and-so, well, what's going on today as you check their pulse? Fast, slow, irregular, things like that. Abnormal vital signs, is it, you know, if their heart rate's 30, they require evaluation. That's it, you know, there's something going on. Um, if their blood pressure is, you know, 60 over 40, they need evaluation at that point. Just these two simple things, you know, how they look, I should say three, but pulse is typically part of the vital signs. How they look and their vital signs when you first walk in the door, that can give you so much information right off the bat. Now, if those, those things are fine, you move forward and you look a little deeper and you start looking for those red flags and the risk factors that might increase the probability. And like we said, you check vital signs, just like we said. Oftentimes, uh, their blood pressure is high. I'm sorry, I wrote blood often high. It's supposed to be blood pressure is often high. They're anxious. Now, you know, 260, 240 over something, that's a little bit different than 170 over so-and-so, uh, especially in the indication that you might be worried about some kind of aneurysm. Um, honestly, with me, I am more worried about low blood pressure. Um, if it's too high, obviously, if you're in the in, you know area of stroke or something like that, that's different. But low blood pressure and cardiac chest pain is a little bit more worrisome to me unless you're concerned for an eruption, eruptive aneurysm. Um, for those of you who work in the ER, you know that, you know, aneurysm, the first things you do is you decrease their heart rate and then you decrease their pressure. That's why the pressure is worrisome. However, if a person <clears throat> is having, a, say, an inferior MI and it's right-sided and you have no blood pressure, that person is going to decompensate rather quickly. So rule number two, Keep your approach organized and focused and try to keep calm as much as possible. It's going to be in your head worrisome, um, especially if, I mean, if you worked in a facility like I do, which I'm assuming a lot of you probably do, you know, you're 52 miles from nowhere. Uh, you are the only provider there. It's you and one MA 
and you know you're responsible for an area that you know is a like I can't I can't even remember how many thousand people live in that area. So the first place they're going to come is to you. So when they show up, you know you kind of actually become this little ER assessment for it. So when the person comes in, a lot of times they know each other. There's going to be high um, anxiety going around all over the place. So the main thing is if you remain calm, it makes the patients remain calm. It helps their blood pressure. It helps their vital signs. Like I said, it helps them, you know, determine that you may know what you're doing, but it also keeps your staff calm and allows them to focus on what they're doing. Again, this seems basic. It, it seems like it, you know, I shouldn't even have to be said, but it, it does see, you do see it, um, on occasion. Um, and then focus your 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 vitals and your signs and symptoms you're looking for on the cardiovascular conditions. So, like I said, when you're questioning, but also you know looking at their their um, their physical exam. So the patient says, you know, I have boring chest pain, like we said, front to back, hypertension, and smoking, and they have a new murmur. Then I really worry about maybe underlying dissection. The patient needs to go. If they're diaphoretic. The chest pain is non-provocable. It's radiating to both arms. Obviously, they need to go. History of hyperlipidemia, diabetes, they're higher risk for ACS. So there's really not much at that point, uh, but they, they definitely need evaluation. Now, if the person looks fine, um, they just kind of complain of this little like pinching in their chest. I'm not sure exactly what it is. They may have a history of high blood pressure. Um, it kind of comes and goes those kind of things, eh, that doesn't necessarily seem like a cardiac issue, but I still need to get more. Their vital signs are stable. They look fine. They're, pale, or they're uh, pink, warm, and dry, or normal, warm, and dry. Those kind of things are what you're looking at. But just keep it focused. Um, a lot of times, you know, going off into those other tangents that sometimes we all, you know, especially newer, newer APPs, you know, allergies and all those other stuff, those things are important, especially if you're going towards treatment, but focusing in your exam on what I'm looking for things that are going to kill this patient if I miss them. Those are the things I'm looking for. Um, so this should say cardiac examination does not start with taking a complete history. Like I said, it takes with focusing on the complaint at hand and looking for risk factors that back up or further increase the probability of underlying cause that may cause deterioration. That in combination with red flag symptoms and other things. So start by getting a good understanding of the complaint. So, you know, explain what you're feeling right now. What does it feel like? You know, what makes it worse? What makes it better? Um, have you ever had this happen before? Those kind of things just kind of build on that understanding of what exactly is going on. And typically those things, some people use the OPQRST, which is onset, you know, provoke uh, quality, uh, radiation, severity, and time. Or some people just say, you know, onset, location, character, aggravating factors, radiation, and timing. These things are important because each one of these things builds upon the other one to increase the probability of potential underlying or cardiovascular disease. And each one has its own important um, aspect in the assessment. So again, what were you doing when the system symptoms started? So you do worry about people that, you know, are exerting themselves, especially older populations, you know, are they having some form of coronary ischemia? Um, those kind of things decrease blood flow to the pericardium, which can cause, you know, cardiac damage. Did it wake you from sleep? That's another one that's concerning. Um, or were you just sitting there at rest? <clears throat> were you doing push-ups? Um, that could be costrochondral type stuff, you know. Um, you know, were you lifting? Were you twisting something? All those kinds of things are very important. Did it come on all of a sudden, or was it a gradual onset? Now, yeah, it came on quite, you know, quite suddenly, but not that intense. Um, that's a little bit less than it came on full or extremely strong all at once. That's a little bit worrisome for uh, you know underlying aneurysm. Nothing, I was told at one point uh, during my training is nothing good comes on fast and strong. And then nothing um, bad gets better with medications. So anything that comes on that strong, just right off the bat, be highly suspicious that there's something going on. Like I said, exercise or rest, 
Um, and don't forget to ask, especially in the younger populations, about workouts and routines and liftings and things like that. Because a lot of times those do lead you to kind of seeing that this, it might be a, a musculoskeletal type issue. Like I was saying, red flags, it's sudden onset, right? Aneurysm could be one, cardiac arrhythmia. Now you're going to notice that when you first walk in and you feel their pulse, okay? I don't necessarily think I feel an arrhythmia, but that's one thing. Embolism will come on quick. My pain is sharp. It came on all of a sudden and I couldn't catch my breath. Some things we're seeing every once in a while now, especially with you know, younger populations is they're, they're doing things like um, puffing paints or um, doing other kinds of things that actually cause pneumothorax in their lungs. So coming on quick and fast, now it can be gradual, but sometimes when they pop a drop a lung, you know, I suddenly just couldn't breathe. So that's where my assessment needs to come in and, and looking from that aspect. Um, your patient that, you know, has an esophageal rupture, um, they may have, you know, a history of Barrett's. They may drink. They may have a procedure recently. A lot of times that comes on. They can't swallow. They're vomiting blood um, or they can't get anything to come up. They may be drooling a little bit, those kind of things. Those are red flags to really worry about. So the pain description, right? Use the patient's words, right? It's important not to, you know, does it feel tight or does it feel sharp or does it feel, because a lot of times, one, if they're really worried about it, they'll agree with you. But two, it doesn't allow them to really focus their, their thought process. So tell me what it feels like. Well, it's sharp. Okay. Well, sharp can mean a lot of things. You know, sharp decreases my risk of ACL, ACS, but still may be, you know, pulmonary embolism type things. So I might look at what my patient is. Um, are they younger on birth control and they smoke? Then my risk goes back up. Are they not? Uh, is it sharp? What about when you take a deep breath? Does it get worse? Okay, my probability goes down at that point, right? Um, but then at the same time, they tell you something like, you know, I was born with a heart um, uh, congenital problem, then my suspicion goes back up again. So it's kind of weeding through this. So you're looking for the probability aspect of it. Make sure you, you know, you ask, ask open, or open, um, open questioning is what I'm trying to say. If it's atypical of AACS, listen for complaints of red flag different, differentials, okay? So my fingers tingle, right? I get this pain that kind of comes, it kind of comes and go, but my fingers tingle, right? That's not necessarily suggestive of ACL, ACS. Now, there might be an anxiety component to it, but the patient's blood pressure is very high, okay? <clears throat> and they do say that, you know, on occasion, it goes to my back. Um, and you also notice, you know, there's a pack of cigarettes in their, in their, you know, front pocket. So it may be atypical of ACS, but there's that other differential we don't want to miss, which is that aneurysm. Okay. So those kind of things, it may be related to, you know, their neck. So, you know, things like, what if you move your arms and it gets worse, those kind of things, you know, you know kind of slightly decrease it. But the main thing is focusing on, I'm just solely looking for those things that are gonna tell me there's something significant going on. Cause you always start at the top, worst case scenario and work your way down. Red flags, like I said, nothing good comes on strong and fast. So it's the worst pain I ever had. And it came on all of a sudden, I was just talking to somebody and I clutched my chest and I couldn't, I went to my knees and it has not let up since then. ACS pain, we always know this. I mean, again, it's not always every patient. So every patient is not textbook, right? Deep squeeze, achy, non-provocable. There's a concern, especially based on age. And then I start asking risk factors and looking at their vital signs and looking at their impression. I'm way more suspicious, right? Now, also, you think about sometimes, a lot of you know this is, say, an 80-year-old female, you know, you go and you they come in and they've just been fatigued for three days. That's That also can be a late uh, ACLS problem. A lot of times those patients will have abnormal vital signs. So their heart rate's very low. Um, if they have an inferior infarct, they'll go into a third degree heart block, those kind of things. So, but they look fine, but there's something going on, you know, and you start to dig deeper and then you look at these risk factors, including age. And then, you know, that may lead you right back down to ACLS or ACS um, rabbit hole. Sharp, 
provoked by respiration, you can consider PE, consider pneumothorax, especially in those COPDers, the smokers, the young boys that are really tall. Um, PE, they may have a history, they may have anti, you know, they might have a um, coagulable uh, congenital state that you might need to worry about, those kind of things. Um, however, you know, if I get the um, 20 year old um, uh, guy with the normal, um, but little signs, he looks great. Um, he's complaining his chest hurts. When you take a deep breath, it hurts. And then you press on his chest and he says, ow. And then you say, that's the same pain. And he says, yes, less likelihood, no murmurs, non-radiating, suspicion drops at that point. Okay. And that can happen with, you know, older people as well. Obviously your suspicion may be a little bit higher, but you know, typically when you're press, I mean, I get this in corrections every once in a while is that, you know, the person may have, you know, significant cardiac history or risk. Uh, but then they tell you that, you know, this doesn't feel like the last time. And then I press on their chest and they're like, oh, don't do that again. Then I'm less suggestive at that point. Severe stabbing front to back, consider the aneurysm, consider the rupture right off the bat. Location, these are important too. Can the patient localize it with one finger? Where do you feel it, right? Don't be, is it on the left or the right? No, say where, point. A lot of times they'll say, you know, what I see sometimes is I see this or this versus this sometimes. You know, it's like right here. This is is more concerning than this, right? Because if it's just right here, probably not cardiac. If I push there, does it hurt? Yes. If I breathe deep, does it hurt right there? Yes, probably not cardiac. Now, if it's here and I say, take a deep breath, no, it doesn't change it at all. Can you lean forward? Does it change it? No. What about if you lay back? No, it doesn't change it. Highly suspicious at that point. Remember laying back, that's those alcoholics a lot of times with pancreatitis. But typically those patients are leaning forward and they're, uh, it hurts anyway. So that's one thing. Diffuse more risky than one finger or just right here. And sometimes they'll say it's really sharp and it's right here and it kind of pinches and it comes and goes. You know, they don't have a pacemaker, obviously. Um but, you know, that's a little bit less concerning and worrisome at that point. Is it your whole chest? Is it substernal? Is it right, left? Does it radiate down into your belly, right? Abdominal, you're going to look for that right upper quadrant. Now, you know, the older, you know, higher risk patients, you know, you might think coley, but, you know, you do worry about uh, ACS in that same area. It can radiate. However, you know, the... Um, you know, uh, pregnant female or post um, um, delivery female, a couple weeks later, they start developing that right upper quadrant, kind of radiates up into my chest. Uh, they're, you know, a little bit obese. Um, they do have a history of hyperlipidemia in the past. You know, you think about that coli um, right in that area too. So they might have, you know, then the questions might be saying, what provokes it, right? Um, well, I did just eat two hours ago, so that's one thing to think about with that too. Um, you know, it's not that's not necessarily it. Um, but patients that are a little bit older, that still can be that up, right upper quadrant there, especially if it radiates up. Now, you know, if it be really suspicious though, if that front radiates to the back, then you'd be more worrisome. Okay, as far as that goes, does it radiate up into your neck and jaw? Obviously, things like your coli doesn't go up into your neck and jaw. Things that radiate up into your neck and jaw are a little bit more concerning. Carotid rupture or carotid aneurysms, um, you know, ACS, things like that. That's one thing I worry about. So I'm listening for that. Where does it go? Well, it comes up into my jaw, right up on this side of the face. From here, higher suspicion at that point. Like I said, does it go to your back? Let's think. Um, Provoking uh, or alleviating, it's very important. This is a lot of times, I, I don't see a lot of people do this. Um, they'll do a great assessment. They'll listen to their heart. They'll listen to their lungs. They'll press on their belly sometimes, uh, those kind of things. But don't forget to push on their chest and ask them if it's the same pain. So if I push and it's like, oh, guess, stop, don't do that, especially if it's a sharp pain or something like that, my prob probability dropped at that point. Okay, um, if their vital signs are stable, my probability drop and they look good. 
So that's one thing. Don't forget about it. Okay. Especially moving. If you move forward, does it get better? Okay. Um, if you move back, does it get better? If you took tongues, did it get better? Those kind of things are, those are important to do. Does breathing make it worse? Does breathing make it better? Um, what medications did you try? Did you try some, you know, Tylenol before I got here or before you came in? Did that help? Yeah. Well, that may be something else. A lot of times Tylenol doesn't help cardiac induced pain. Um, do you carry nitroglycerin? Did you take that? Did it help? Yeah. So angina, you have a history of angina. It got better. So we can further move along from that. Now, a lot of times those MIs and anything like that, uh, you'll give them those sprays of nitro and it doesn't help. They just sit there. It, it doesn't go away. So that's one indication too to worry about. Red flags, you can't provoke it, right? I'm pushing. It's it, Nothing I do is making it better. Okay. It's, it's just always there. That's an increased risk for ACS. It's an increased risk for aneurysm. Uh, provoked by respiration, especially associated with a tachycardia. <clears throat> Those are typically, you know, PEs, um, things like that. Um, it, they're very subtle and you don't get a lot of information. Um, you have to kind of delve into it. So that's the most common finding on a PE patient is uh, tachycardia. So the chest, sharp chest pain, they make a plane of shortness of breath, but their main finding when you actually do your physical exam is you'll find is tachycardia. So those things go together and we'll talk about well scoring and things a little bit later. Increased pain with swallowing or coughing. Um, those kind of things are worrisome for rupture, right? I tried to drink some water to see if it went away. I just couldn't get it down and it made it 10 times worse, right? If they ruptured, they just poured fluid into their media, you know, that they're right in the middle. And so that's going to cause extreme pain. Um, failure of the nitroglycerin with the history of angina that increases the chances of underlying MI. So you really got to worry about that too. Um, does the pain or sensation move anywhere? Does it go down your arms, right arm, left arm? One thing that's probability wise, a uh, higher predictor they found uh, according to um, American Academy of Family Practice is that both arms is a higher probability of ACS, okay? Um, another one is um, eating or drinking increasing pain, asking them about their history, are you a heavy drinker? Um, if, you, if they lay back and they tell you it gets worse and it's right in the middle, pancreatitis goes up on the list too. So those things are very important. Like I said, radiation, left arm, right arm, it really doesn't matter. Bilateral jaw, bilateral arms and shoulder, those are higher risk. And don't forget about paresthesia. A lot of people just think, well, that might be a pinched nerve, but that's actually seen quite a bit when it comes to um, in your, in your or aortic dissection. It's important with the legs or in, in the uh, uh, arms too. So be really cognizant of that. Increasing extremity paresthesia, watch for that. And this is a great article. I don't know if you guys saw it in the uh, recent ASEP uh, paper. Um, it, you know, Dissection is a very high misdiagnosis rate and has a very high level of fatality. Um, it often mimics a lot of things. So risk factors, blood pressure, smoking, um, age over 50, all those kind of things. And in that pain in the middle, front to back, paresthesias, be very, very high suspicion of that. Even not even with the chest, you know, person comes in with excruciating low back pain. Yeah, it radiates around to the front and I'm getting some tingling into my feet. I, and they're obese, I'm very much worried about a lower uh, aortic dissection at that point. Uh, this is a great thing it says in there, no benign disease gets, should require morphine. So if, it gets, if it's that bad, your suspicion should go way higher. And that's more for uh, people in things like that. Severity, oftentimes vital signs do reflect severity. I see that quite a bit. They say it's the worst pain of their life. They're not on any beta blockers or other medications. And you look at their vitals and they're 100% stable. Um, that could give you a little bit of indication it's not that severe. Um, it's not 100%, but it, it can help you. How do they look? Can they tell you? Is it too painful? Can they not even answer your questions? It's so boring. Higher suspicion, higher worsome. Are they speaking normally like me to you, smiling? Lower risk, okay? But still, obviously, it needs more um, you need to look into it more. Nothing, again, like I said, comes on uh, strong and fast. And rarely does anything get better with initial treatment. Um, perfect example with, you know, aneurysms, uh, things like that. Uh, 
or um, I mean, even going even further, um, you know, subarachnoid bleeds that come on all of a sudden, those typical things, they don't get better with initial treatment. Um, pain out of proportion for exam, that's another one, especially if it's in that, you know, the elderly female or male um, may have a history of past AFib. They have that left upper quadrant pain. Yeah, you think of ACS, but one thing you need to think about is mesenteric ischemia at the same time. A lot of times those patients have a severe pain, but you press on their belly and you're not getting much. Higher suspicion for something like that. Timing duration, how long does it last? Is it continuous? Uh, continuous has not changed, higher risk. If it comes and goes, um, if you're not seeing any evidence of underlying arrhythmia, otherwise, a um, little bit less suspicion at that point. Rule three, focus on the factors that increase the diagnostic probability of potential for deterioration. That's what I always do when I focus on something or do my assessment is I look for those red flags and I look for those key words that pop up in my head when they say it, that I need to look into that more. So some of those things are, I can't catch my breath. I feel short of breath, okay? Um, I'm vomiting. I, I feel nauseous, okay? Cardiac problems do cause that. Hematemesis, so they, they throw ups and there's some blood in there. Are you an alcoholic? Things like that. Uh, fever, URI symptoms, think endocarditis, myocarditis, um, those kind of things. Diaphoresis, that's right off the bat. If they're sweating and they're pale, there's something going on at that point. Um, coughing, but particularly hemoptysis, if they're coughing up blood, um, they may have a pneumo, they may have a PE. Um, dyspepsia, so it's severe dyspepsia. Say you give them a GI cocktail, you give them something, it doesn't go away. Um, and, you know, obviously you're not going to pour something down their throat if you think they have a rupture. Um, but that is an indication that, you know, that's, that, that can be concerning. Edema in their legs, decompensating. Calf pain or swelling, DVT could move up. Recent illness, URI symptoms, like I said, um, may have myocarditis associated with it or palpitations, they may be going in and out of AFib, in and out of SVT, all those things, it's very important in other ones to think of those things. Associated signs may represent decompensation, doping and stability. So these things, these review of systems, they kind of add up after a while. The more of these things they have going on, your probability starts kind of going up. And let them tell you it, okay? Don't ask them straight up, do you have fever? You know, do you have diet? You know, do you have a cough? You know, just ask what symptoms, what other symptoms have you been having? Those kind of things. Don't lead it. Going back. So again, so you've gone through your patient looks good. Their vital signs are good. Um, they're not in significant distress. You know, you definitely don't see any significant red flags standing out right now. Um, then look for focused risk factors. Have you had a cardiac problem before? Yes. Did you have an MI? Yes. Did it feel exactly like this? Yes. Did it come on exactly like this? Yes. What did they do? They put in a stent, high risk at that point. Uh, vascular, um, did you have stents placed in your legs? Um, do you have a history of DVT? Do you have a history of PE? Yes, 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 higher risk. GI, did you have a procedure done lately? Um, have you had a, a bleed, a rupture, all those kind of things. Do you shoot IV drugs? Do you drink alcohol? You're less coagulable if you drink alcohol. Did you get smacked in the chest? You think about tamponade, um, you know, a car accident, something like that. Family history, that's important too, you know. Mom and dad, they died at 55. How old are you? I'm 52. Kind of the same, higher, you know, that could increase your risk as well. Also, you know, hey, my mom had connective tissue disease or, you know, my brother has connective tissue disease. I'm tall and lanky. I can put my thumbs all the way around my arms like this right? Then I can't do it, obviously. But Marfan's people can do that. So then the, you worry about that. Um, those are higher risk for dissection, right? And then any new medications you've taken, right? So, oh, yeah, I, I was placed on, you know, uh, Toprol or, you know, dig, Digoxin or something. And they may have an arrhythmia underlying there, or their heart rate might be too slow, or they might have overdosed uh, or something like that. Those things are all important. Um, Oh, I, I, all the kind of things I just went over, you know, prior, you know, smoking, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, all this is bread and butter stuff. You guys know, um, recent surgery, do they have cancer now? Do they take oral contraception, recent procedures, uh, even recent childbirth, um, 
endocarditis, coronary spasm, they, do they do cocaine? That's one thing. People do cocaine, coronary spasm, they can have MIs from that. Tamponade, pneumothorax, um, all the things we just talked about. Prolonged QT, that's another one too. Um, you know, medications may not know they have a prolonged QT until you get an EKG, but then you look and they're on medications that prolong it further that can cause cardiac complications. Look at those high risk areas on exam, okay? Like we talked about earlier, evaluate the vital signs. Like we talked about earlier, too fast, too slow, too high, too low, right? General appearance, how do they skin? Um, pink, warm and dry, normal, warm and dry. That's a good sign. I should go back to the evaluate. One thing always with the chest pain patients, don't forget to take a blood pressure here and a blood pressure here. So if, you're, you know, if your systolic pressures are 20 points different and they're having boring chest pain, high risk for aneurysm, okay? Especially feeling their pulses, feeling both sides, are they equal? That's one thing to worry about as well. Um, skin exam, do you see any rashes? Make sure to you know take all of it off, look. Uh, neck exam. Do you see JVD poking out, right? Pulsations, swelling in one side of the neck, consistent that might have a you know a, um, dissection or sorts. Do you find brewies there, right? Chest exam, press, does it hurt? Does it not hurt? Do I hear a murmur, okay? Um, with the heart exam, is it faint, right? Um, is it irregular, those kind of things? Listening to their lungs, are they clear and equal? Only one side is. Uh, do I see rowels, so they're decompensating into heart failure? Abdominal exam, do I hear a pulsating mass pressure going on? That stuff is important. And then obviously always look at their extremities. Pinch their calves, look for any swelling. Do I see are their pulses and their feet equal? Are the cap refill all over equal? Those things are important. Can you feel both sides? Um, again, lower abdominal aneurysms, upper abdominal aneurysms, they can cause paresthesias. Those things are very important. Um, like I said, don't forget to both sides. If absent, low BP, right? So if I walk up and I take the pulse and I can't find it, that's lower than 90 systolic. So that person, you know, get a, get a blood pressure if you can, but that person probably should, you know, lay down, feet up, those kind of things. Um, diaphoresis and distress, obviously, those are very good indicators. Looking for rash or trauma on the skin exam, like we talked about. JVD. Backing fluid up, right-sided heart failure you worry about. Reducible, producible pain, lower risk. Assess for murmurs, especially if they have a fever, drug, IV drug abuse, um, pain radiating front to back. That aortic um, valve is often commonly found when a person has a aortic dissection. So that's one thing to hear, listen for. Abnormal lung sounds, uh, abdominal tenderness or pain out of proportion, especially in the elderly. Uh, and that left upper quadrant, that's very important. Um, pulses, are they swelling? Is it symmetric or are the pulses equal? Is it only one? Okay. And then I just wanted to talk about that again before, is that sometimes it's not even thought of, and obviously it, it goes with your population base, but especially with the increasing epidemic of fentanyl use, a lot of times they smoke it, but there are some people that shoot it. Some people are too scared of that, but they continue to use heroin, So and they shoot heroin. So that's always should be on your on your radar, um, especially in the younger population that comes in. They have a little bit of evidence of heart failure. They have a nuanced murmur. They may have had fevers on and off for a while. You're highly suspicious, especially if you're looking and you see track marks. Endocarditis is very, very important not to miss that. Um, we're starting to see patients in the correctional setting. And I'm sure this is, I mean, I've only been there for two years, but you know, I, I've had patients uh, recently with a 30-year-old with a guy that um, used methamphetamines, IV, uh, who had an injection fracture of 9%. Um, and that was, in, in previous to that, he had endocarditis. So those kind of things, always be aware of what you're looking for. Janeway lesions, splinter, splinter hemorrhages. Um, I could be honest, I've never seen a splinter hemorrhage, but it is something that you can see. So exam findings, right? We talked about that. Blood pressures, both arms, 20 point difference. Uh, that's not like a set in stone rule, but generally, you know, if they're different, that's important. Their pulses are different. Be concerned for underlying problems with an aorta problem. Uh, unequal radial pulses, hypotension in general. Cardiac complaints, hypotension, that's a red flag right off the bat. 
diaphoresis, bradycardia, tachycardia. Now, you know, a lot of times like, they're worked up and their heart rate's 112 or something. That's one thing. Um, but it, when, you know, it, when it's 140, um, that's, that's a little bit more worrisome. Um, or, you know, even 112 if you're worried about a PE. But bradycardic, so they're down in the 40s and they're not on any beta blockers, especially even if they are on beta blockers, that's a more concerning as well. Significant distress. I bent over, I'm leaning forward. Um, those kind of things are, are, you know, more worrisome. Um, younger populations, you know, they can still have the big things, but you do worry about, you know, pancreatitis, alcohol abuse, those kind of things, uh, especially if it's necrotic um, and it's been going on for a while. Older populations, you worry more aortic aneurysms, ACS, not to say that each doesn't go back and forth, that each can't have that. JVD, decompensation is what you worry about, especially if it's new. New onset murmur, we just talked about that. Brewy, they may not, the flow may be uh, interrupted. Dissections can actually cause brewies up in that area. JVD, we just said that twice. Sorry about that. Non-provocable pain, we talked about that. Shortness of breath, especially with tachycardia. They worry about PE. Rouse, uh, that could be a decompensation. Absent lung sounds, pneumothorax. External trauma, flail chest you worry about. If you press on their chest and you can move it, especially if they've been in some form of trauma, that's definitely a red flag. Pulsating mass in their abdomen uh, and new onset peripheral edema. Uh, one thing that's great, if anybody's got training in it, is uh, the point of care ultrasound. Some of these things you can actually see on there pretty easily. It can also help you guide your path. I, I do recommend people take courses like that. And then we talked about Tools, you guys should look these up um, if you're kind of on the fence. And these are also great things to document into your chart that you thought of these things. The ADDRS also gives you a probability of potential underlying dissection or aneurysm. Wells criteria for PE, those PERC, and then there's Wells um, for PE or DVT. I don't, I mean, PERC to me is, I mean, it's there, but it just tells you yes or no. Wells gives you a little bit more higher probability. Uh, the heart score, obviously, if you're working within a primary care clinic, you don't have access to a troponin, but it can give you a little bit of indication without the troponin that they're higher risk. So the more points they get, obviously, things you worry about. And then there are others out there. MedCalc is a great thing to look at. All right, real quick. So I just wanted to review the EKG really quick. It's both a curse and a blessing because a normal EKG doesn't mean they're fine. So that's an important thing to say. We all know these things, the no-brainer, the ST elevation and the ST depression. The one on the left, elevation is injury. Depression is typically ischemia, or it could be what they call reciprocal change, coming from a different portion of the heart that has the ST elevation. I didn't go much into that. This is just primarily for the other things. Uh, everyone knows the different areas of the heart. I always recommend, remembered is Lili Sal, so, you know, uh, L I I, then you skip a, um, AVR at first. L I S S A A L L, lateral, inferior, inferior, skip, lateral, inferior, septal, septal, anterior, anterior, lateral, lateral. And then once all those things look good or that you don't see any ST elevation, you go back to uh, the AVR looking for uh, a left main coronary artery. And you're looking for two contingent leads that show the same pattern in them. The thing that I do want to talk about are some of the uncommon and more subtle EKG findings like Wellen syndrome, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy you might see, epsilon waves, third degree heart blocks, uh, regatta syndrome, left main coronary artery and posterior infarction. These things we don't typically think of. We're just looking for that EKG and we're looking for that elevation right off the bat. And we're not thinking about these other things that may exist that don't look exactly look like that. So Wellen syndrome is important. It's it, what it shows is stenosis of the left anterior um, descending artery, and it doesn't necessarily look like ST elevation. And what you see over there on the on the side here, I think I can make this work, is you get this wave component right here. Um, that kind of like that Z. That's what you worry about. Uh, and typically, those have been anterior leads, so two, three, or what you can get is just a straight depression like that. As you can see, it's not a typical ST elevation, but this pattern here in two of the contingent leads like this, you worry about that being an underlying um, uh, occlusion of the or stenosis caused 
causing an occlusion of that left anterior descending artery. And those patients do require evaluation. Another one, especially within the younger populations or even, you know, uh, people that are drug abuse, things like that, or that um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, it typically can be a genetic mutation, especially within the younger people. Uh, things you worry about is that younger patient that, you know, uh, is exercising and they pass out. Um, those patients you really worry about, as far as with the cardiomyopathy, uh, they do need echoes, they need evaluation at that point. One thing you're looking for in these, though, is you're looking for these dagger waves. So these right below the esoteric line there, or sorry, iso, isometric line, you get these dagger waves that just shoot straight down. See, that just points straight down. That's a higher risk for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So be advised of that. Um, you can also see that in um, patients with history of IV drug abuse. That's a, you know, a wall disruption um, that's causing those issues. So be aware of that. Typically, if it's if it's with exertion, they do pass out, or they feel like they're going to pass out. You get pulmonary congestion associated with it, exertional shortness of breath, chest pain, or palpitations, and you see those dagger waves. Suspicion for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy should go up at that point. All right, this is another one, the epsilon waves. What you get is this little, right after the QRS, you get this little blip, and it can happen over here too. Um, it can be seen, you know, diff, you know, it's typically seen diffusely, it's all over. It's a genetic disorder of myocardium. It's kind of like a fatty buildup on the wall. And what it does is it predisposes you to an arrhythmia, and it can lead to uh, ventricular uh, or asystole. Um, so if a person's kind of complaining of these pains that kind of comes and goes, I feel some palpitations, you look on there, you see an epsilon wave like that, high suspicion that they may be going in and out of some kind of arrhythmia, and that person does evaluate, need evaluation. Third degree heart block, we talked about this one a little bit before. Uh, one thing that's important to know about this, obviously, you're going to check somebody's pulse and it's going to be really low. Uh, so you're going to know right off the bat, the patient needs a cardiac evaluation. But one thing to consider about this is, yeah, it's slow, but a lot of times these inferior infarcts will actually turn into a third degree heart block. So um, these patients, you should be very high, highly suspicious that they may have had an MI uh, recently. Uh, my my experience with that was an 80-year-old female that was brought to the ER that was... Um, feeling fatigued for three days. Um, and we put her on the monitor and she was in a third degree heart block. Uh, and it did come out that she eventually had had an inferior infarct um, and this kind of, you know, uh, waited it out. <clears throat> you know, the, the elderly women, they're very strong. They've had multiple children. They, you know, they typically can endure more discomfort than a man can, honestly. So those kind of things do, do happen. Regatta is another important one. A lot of people don't, this is not a familiar one with them, but it's a very important one to notice. Sometimes you can just pick this up on, you know, just routine EKGs. Um, the main thing is this little arch, this triangle that comes up right after the QRS wave. Um, or, you know, what you'll see is um, kind of like uh, this little like saddle that kind of comes along here. <clears throat> this is a sodium uh, channel. Uh, genetic deficiency. Uh, it's usually a gene mutation commonly seen in Southeastern Asian uh, populations. So these people can get, you know, pass out. They can have, you know, kind of these um, you know, vague uh, um, cardiac type symptoms. Uh, but the important part of this is to not to miss because it does have a high incidence of um, sudden cardiac death. Um, it's even known over there as SUNS, which is that nocturnal death syndrome. Um, that's unexplained. So um, the medium age is 41. So it's just something to be be aware of at that point. Um, so some of these th things, especially with the Brugada, that can unmask it sometimes. You don't always see it, but, you know, ischemia, multiple drugs, you know, different drugs, cocaine, alcohol, sometimes those kind of things can actually bring out the rhythm so you see it after them. Um, those kind of patients, if you see them later on in the clinic and it's not something emergent, they definitely need to be uh, followed up on cardiology. But just know those things can be brought out by various aspects as well. So here's an example you can see right there, V1, V2. Um, you can see that um, 
that kind of triangle looking uh, abnormality there. Uh, kind of have that kind of dips down a little bit. Um, that's one thing to consider with that. A uh, last thing, real quick, um, as far as these, uh, well, this isn't the last thing, but one to worry about too is some people don't think about, which is the um, left main coronary artery infarction. So when you're going down your your pattern here and you're looking and I don't see anything laterally, I do see some depression here in two and three. So obviously there's something going on I need to worry about um, and they need evaluation. And I can see that diffusely, but I don't see elevation and I just keep going. And I see a little bit there, but I don't see it there. But then I see diffuse global ischemia and I don't see any elevation necessarily because this is not in two leads back to back. And I go back to AVR and I see ST elevation. So if you think about it, that is indicative of a main coronary artery uh, occlusion because the LAD and the left circumflux come off of that artery. So, and then the LAD, the septal branches come off of that. So these are the septal branches. And then your LAD is here. Or the, typically, this whole thing is really the LAD, but these are typically right over the septal branches as well. So you can see the ischemia because of this blockage coming down and then also including the left circumflux because uh, the, all these arteries are below um, this left main coronary artery. Now, this can be you know uh, some posterior involvement because that wraps around the back. Uh, this can just be global ischemia from, you know, the heart pumping harder, or this could be some form of reciprocal change. But that's one thing to look at. Don't forget to look at that AVR, especially in the uh, indication that there's global ischemia that's important. Like I said, there we go. And that's, you can see up here, that's the left main branches. So if this is occluded, you could see why you'd see it in the left circumflux, and you can see it why you'd see it in the left anterior descending and the septal branches down there. Posterior infarction, Jeez, I'm going longer than I thought. Um, I'm almost done. Um, one thing to not miss as well. So if I'm going down my uh, patterns and I come across V1 and I see that um, uh, inverted T wave and I go down and then I see depression and then I see depression, obviously this patient needs a cardiac evaluation, but I don't see ST elevation anywhere, particularly within the um, uh, septal and anterior branches in here, if you're seeing ischemia, don't just assume it's ischemia. Remember, reciprocal change is um, if you have ST elevation and you just shove a needle straight through the heart, what you're going to get is you're going to get the mirror image on the other side. So if this is in the back of the heart, you know, in the back of the heart, I'm having ST elevation and I shove a needle straight through my back and come out to the front, where those leads sit, I'm going to get ST depression here. So it's important to think about that could be a posterior infarct, and you can also switch the leads to the back and get a, a, um, a an EKG on the back of the chest or back of the um, uh, on the patient's back to see if there's ST elevation as well. Obviously, you already know there's a cardiac issue, so this patient needs to be sent out. But you know, it is also more worrisome if the patient has reciprocal change from ST elevation, then they just have ischemia. Because sometimes ischemia can actually clear up for a moment with nitroglycerin. So that's one thing to think about. And that's where I was talking about right in here. And then to talk about reciprocal change again, so you can see the back of the heart is where the uh, infarction is. So if I put my leads on the front across the sternum, I'm gonna see that ST depression right there. I'm sorry, my picture's right in the way. Uh, but if I put it on the back of the heart, I'm going to see the ST elevation back there because this is a reciprocal change straight through the heart. And sometimes you get a little bit of a, of a ventricular axis shift, but we didn't talk about that at this point. Now, other things with the EKG, there's all kinds of things um, that we talked about. Hyperkalemia to worry about, massive cardiac effusion. Typically, those have very small voltage complexes. Um, I have never seen this before, I'll be honest with you, this um, intracranial hemorrhage. Um, Wolf Parkinson's white, you get the delta wave that sits right there. Um, 
and then uh, left ventricular hypertrophy, we really didn't talk about that, but a lot of times you'll see that in the indication where there's heart failure, which could be secondary to an MI as well. Other ones we didn't talk about were like bundle branch blocks. Now, new onset bundle left bundle branch block, um, that can be indicative of an anterior infarct as well. So that's where it's important to have comparative EKGs to see if they were in that before or they weren't. Because if they weren't, suspicion goes way up. If it looks the same, suspicion needs to be, uh, it's, it's around the same, then you need to keep building upon that. Um, hospital or home, these are all things you're going to think about. Um, obviously, you're always going to err on the side of caution. And you're also going to discuss this with their patient to determine their comfort level. If they are not comfortable with it, I would recommend they go get seen, okay? Um, if there's something in your gut, I would recommend they go get seen. Um, if there's something in your gut and you tell them to go get seen and they don't want to, they need to sign something saying that you want them to go and they don't want to go. Um, any high risk patient based on your assessment findings require diagnostic examination. So red flags, vital signs out of limit, pale, diaphoretic, um, uh, signs and symptoms consistent, those associated signs, uh, nausea, vomiting, um, shortness of breath, all those things, they build up on each other. They increase the probability they need to be seen. Always err on the side of caution. Like we said, in a doubt, send them out. If low risk, always make sure that there's some kind of follow-up, okay? 24 hours, make sure there's somebody with them. Make sure that they understand that if these symptoms get worse, they need to call my EMS or they need to go. And also with these patients, utilizing those tools like we talked about, the ADDRS, Wells criteria, heart score, even though you don't have a troponin, documenting those things helps your case as well. Um, obviously, you never want to send somebody home that you, you're you like, ah, but, you know, those things decrease the probability. They are there to help you, okay? Never have that patient stay alone. Ensure that they understand that it is documented that you, you talk to them and you told them that they you know, may require ED follow-up if this gets worse. And like I said, document all of those things and ensure the patient is very secure and comfortable with what you're telling them. All right, real quick scenarios. These are really fast Just to kind of go over. These are gonna seem extremely simple. I'm sure you all of you are very experienced. Um, 42 year old male develops sudden chest, anterior chest pain, radiates to his jaw while eating. He denies back pain. His blood pressure is elevated. His pulse is 98. Uh, respirations are 24. Um, SATs are 99%, and his temp is normal. Okay. Sudden onset, that's a red flag to me. Uh, radiates to his jaw, that's a red flag to me. Um, while eating, um, that can be indicative of rupture. So my differentials go from AC, they go ACS, esophageal rupture. Okay. Um, and they also have aneurysm on there, okay? 42-year-old, he's a little bit less, but he is hypertensive. I don't know what he looks like necessarily, but those three are big ones on my list, okay? If he's tall and lanky, you know, you could put pneumothorax on there. Those things to worry about as well. So next, um, he's very tall and thender, or slender, appearing pale, and he's in moderate distress. You notice, notice his stolid murmur. All right, so that's more information, right? I had those red flags, okay? Now I know he's tall and slender. He's also pale and he's moderate distress. I would have known that when I walked in the door. Red flags. So I already got four red flags and now I find a murmur. I got a fifth, okay? He's tall and slender. He could have Marfan's. He could have a connective tissue disease. I'm very highly suspicious. You delegate while you're getting things ready and their EKG looks normal. You don't see anything. This person needs to go, okay? He's 42, sure. Um, don't I don't give you much in the way of his medications or other other things, but he has high risk, high probability of underlying aneurysm, and you cannot say he does not have one. So um, this person gets evaluated. Scenario two, 34-year-old male patient complaining of left side pain. He's sharp. He's a smoker. He does take lisinopril daily for mild hypertension. He denies any other risk factors, and he tells you that there's no cardiac history that he knows of in his family. Say he's pink, warm, and dry. His vital signs are 110 over 70. He took his medications today. He's not tachycardic. You feel his pulse when you first walk in the door. It is regular. Um, it's not fast. He's not, uh, um, 
you know, breathing extremely fast. Um, he's doing just fine. He seems that he's not in a distress. His sats are normal and he has no temp. Normal skin size, his heart seems normal. His lungs are clear. His abdomen's soft. He doesn't have a pulsating mass. You press on his left ribs and it increases pain, but there's no laxity and there's no external findings. And his res respiration increases his pain as well. And then we talked about his lung sounds and they're equal bilaterally. I don't see any evidence of underlying pneumothorax. This is a lower risk patient at this point, okay? You do an EKG on them and it looks normal, even lower risk, okay? Um, patient like this, you know, follow up in 24 hours. Um, he does have, you know, one risk factor in there. He does have a history of hypertension that you know of, so that could increase it a little bit. But definitely have that patient come back, try some things out, make sure he's not alone, make sure you document all of those things in there and why this patient is low risk. That's very important. Last scenario, 38-year-old female with a history of endometriosis, anxiety, asthma, complaining of substernal non-radiating chest pressure, some associated exertional shortness of breath. Her PCP gives her a medication for cramps and anxiety, but she cannot recall the name. Um, so, so those are two different meds, cramps and anxiety, okay? So some people might see this and see that anxiety, and they're 38, they're not that old, um, they may attribute it to maybe some form of anxiety. So, you know, do your fingers tingle? Uh, any stressful event? No. Um, are they hyperventilating? Things like that? No. But they do have a history of endometriosis, and she gets a medication for cramps, which likely due to, um, um, or it might be a, some kind of BCP or something like that. So that places her at higher risk at this point. Um, it doesn't say if it came on fast or slow, but it does not radiate, and it sits right in the middle as a pressure, okay? Vital signs are good, but you do notice that her pulse is elevated, right? So my suspicions for PE have gone up. Probably taking something for uh, a hormone uh, has a history of endometriosis. Say if I listen to her lungs and she does have a history of asthma and they're clear and I don't hear any wheezing, but her SATs are a little bit low, uh, probably not asthma-based. She appears anxious, but her skin signs are normal. She does not have any abnormal heart rhythms or, or sounds on her uh, assessment. Um, her lungs are clear. Abdomen is soft without pulsation or mass. Okay. You do notice that she does have some tender uh, trace swelling noted to the left calf or right calf and down to the, say it goes down to the ankle. Higher risk, right? So I have multiple things going on here. Uh, endometriosis, probably on BCP. You don't know if she smokes. Uh, she's tachycardic. You do have calf tenderness, and um, she uh, um, um, does appear anxious, but that, that's necessarily not part of the problem. But she does have some exertional shortness. So she has several red flags at that point for, for PE, secondary to deep. And then you put her on the EKG, and you see tachycardia. That's important to note. Um, that's more, primarily the only finding you'll see within uh, uh, somebody with a PE. Okay. Uh, one thing to note, a lot of times people talk about the, um, uh, you know, the S1, Q3, T3, that is not specific. Uh, I would not recommend using that. Um, I've had multiple patients who had that, that turned out to be nothing uh, as far as the PE goes. So don't, don't rely on that as diagnostic. So you're going to do your Wells criteria, right? Previous PE, um, you know, uh, Probably they never say they never had one. Is her heart rate greater than 100 beats per minute? Yes. Recent surgery? No. Clinical signs of a DVT? Yes. Three points. Alternative diagnosis less likely? Uh, not really. Doesn't have hemoptysis that we know of and doesn't have cancer, but they're 4.5. That's an intermediate risk. So that person need evaluation um, for an underlying pulmonary embolism. So this should be documented in your chart, things like Wells criteria. All right, last thing. Um, recap, probability of cardiovascular deterioration is based on several factors. And that's what we're going for, is we're going for things that are going to tell me this person has a higher risk of deterioration. Vital signs, skin signs, um, what they're telling me, uh, what I'm finding on exam, and what their risk factors are. You kind of weed it down based off those things and develop differentials from that point. Um, Risk factors add to the probability of differentials. Uh, red flag findings always require further evaluation. So you get a pulsating mass on their belly. Um, 
that needs to be evaluated, especially if they're getting like, I feel like I'm going to pass out or they're tachycardic. Um, you know, uh, radiates front to back with tingling in their fingers, like we talked about. Vital signs and exam findings, those are crucial. Um, and always go with your gut. If everything looks good, and I can't tell you how many times um, I just had this feeling like this person needs to be evaluated. Now, I've been wrong before as far as not wrong that the patient was, uh, you know, uh, had deterioration. I'm talking about I've sent patients to the ER and then they found out there was nothing, but I'd rather that than nothing at all. But I've also had patients where I just something was wrong um, and something just wasn't adding up. And so I did send them and it did find out uh, that there was something going on. So ensure that you go with your gut. That's very, very important. You guys are all very highly trained and you know exactly what you're doing. So that is a very, very good thing to go with. And always err on the side of caution. If you just don't know, and I'm not sure, err on the side of caution. There's nothing wrong with that at all. So last, I just I'd like to say thank you for listening. I do appreciate uh, APP to APP to allowing me to do this lecture. Um, I do like uh, constructive criticism. So if there's anything that you guys see or um, any stories you have or things that I can improve on, please email me. My address is right there. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, and I thank you for your time. And I hope you all stay safe out there and continue to go good. Here's some of the references for the, um, for the lecture. A uh, great EKG uh, site to look at, um, guy I've worked with before, um, is uh, Life in the Fast Lane. I recommend you look at that. Um, it's also cases, but it also gives you EKG um, by diagnosis. So that's a very good thing to look at. All right. Well, I hope you all well and have a good night. Thanks.